Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdy. And today we're taking a look at the latest offering for one of my absolute favorite designers. This is the nine from Quiet Carry. Now Quiet Carry is the brand name of a guy named Bryce Alexander. You could probably tell that he's one of my favorite designers from the fact that I have just so many of his knives. But full disclosure, this one here is also a loner. So stay tuned for a video comparing the regular IQ to his new larger brother. But that name is also reflective of one of the primary reasons why Bryce is one of my favorite designers. These knives all have what you could call a quiet aesthetic. Now I know not everyone's going to be into that kind of clean minimalist design, but for this aesthetic, I think he's a modern master. He has such a good understanding of balance, of symmetry, of how to pair straight lines with curves in just the right locations and proportions. For this look, I think he's doing this better than just about anyone else in the industry today. But the name is also reflective of something else that's really important to me. These knives carry in a quiet way. These are discreet knives. They're all really thin, they're milled out, so they disappear in your pocket to you. But they're all deep carry as well, which means they disappear to other people. These aren't knives that scream, hey, I have a knife in my pocket. Now, something like the IQ, he introduced an even better clip design. This gives you all of the functionality of a milled tie clip with true wraparound deep carry as well. Almost no one else is pulling this off, and this is, like, I think, the best clip design in the industry. I was really pleased to see that he carried this design over to the 9 as well, and we'll talk all about that when we get to the carry section. Now, just as important, the Quiet Carry is known for making slicey knives. On things like the Drift and the Waypoint, we either have a full flat grind or a hollow grind, and more importantly, we have super thin blade stock. Now, Bryce is from California, and he's close to the ocean, so he's no stranger to saltwater. So his knives also tend to be made in things like LC200N, or even more famously, in Vanex. And those are super steels that are literally unrustable. Now, so for me in Oregon, where it's wet all the time, that matters to me. But several of those things are not carried over here into this 9. So when I first saw this, I didn't know if I was going to like it quite as much. It's not as thin. It doesn't have as thin a blade stock, and the blade material isn't 20CV. Now, some things about this are actually going to be better. The action is amazing, and the overall thickness is honestly feels better in the hand than something as thin as this. But I didn't know if I would like those kinds of trade-offs enough. People have been raving about this, and I was a little bit skeptical. But after playing with this for about two weeks... Trust me, I get it. This knife is amazing. Okay, let's talk about this blade. Now, I think you could say the same thing for the knife in general, but especially for the blade, I think this knife is kind of a perfect middle ground between the waypoint and the drift. We've got the nearly full flat grind that we find in the drift, along with the flat portion and large belly. But we then have the straight lines along the top and the clip point like we have on the waypoint. From a blade length perspective, at 3.28 inches, it's just between the two, but it's pretty darn close to the waypoint side. Now, I said the blade stock here isn't as thin, and it isn't. Over here, they always quote this as 0.09, but I measure this at 0.086. Over here, we've got 0.115, so this is just underneath of an inch. And the thing is, though, that by regular knife standards, that's still really thin blade stock, and we have such a good tall grind here. I measured right in the center at just over an inch, and it gets even taller as you go, that this is still fantastic slicing geometry. And there's actually an interesting trade-off. The thinner the blade stock, the less force it takes to push it through material, but the thinner the blade stock, the less comfortable it is to apply that force with your thumb. And so there's a kind of a balance here, where for regular EDC tasks or a small amount of cutting. I love this kind of thin blade stock. But if you're going to be doing a lot of successive cuts in a row or break down a lot of cardboard, this thicker blade stock is actually a little bit preferable because it's not so thick as to be problematic, but it's thick enough that it's noticeably more comfortable after extended use. Now the tip here is fantastic. It's nice and precise, but it's not dainty. I don't think you should pry with any knife, and certainly not this one, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that I would be worried about breaking under normal use. Now, this kind of large belly right here isn't my favorite. I like when knives have a lower down tip because I do a lot of utility cuts, but having that belly spread out means that you don't have to crank your wrist up super hard to get to that tip. Another thing they're doing really, really well is their sharpening twill. The plunge grind here is the thing that takes it from the full thickness to the thinnest behind the edge, and you can see that it ends at the very, very top of the sharpening twill. So while it's not a super deep twill, you do have the entire depth of it to sharpen before you would run into any kind of problem. And because it's such a steep drop off right here, once you did get past that, first of all, you'd be a very different looking knife at that point, but once you did get past that, you could sharpen this similar to like a spider coat or something where you just go up against that edge. And so you're not going to really have a smile under any circumstance. This is an even larger twill than you see on something like the Waypoint, but it's not as big as you find over here where this is intended to be a finger twill as well. 
I think you could technically put your finger right here because they did knock this corner right off. So it's not going to jab you, but I think most people probably wouldn't, or you'd have your finger just back a little bit and have it on this flat part of the handle right there. Now this is a clip point with a distinct corner right here and a flat edge going all the way down. It's worth noting that Bryce actually designed an alternative version of this in a more standard drop point. Now, if you paid really close attention to the very first image he ever posted of this on Instagram, you can actually see that drop point version hiding at the top. And I checked with him and that is indeed what's going on. He said that he might release that at some point, but that the clip point version has always been the plan right off the bat. I suspect that if we were to take this and see that blade with a full drop point, it would probably look something sort of similar to that. The finish on this blade is something that I really love, and it's better than any of the other quiet carry knives before it. It is still a stone wash similar to what you'll have over on something like the Drift, but it's just uh, shinier. Look at that. You can see my, my face right there. And so it has this really beautiful kind of polished stone wash look. If we take the something like the Drift and try to see its reflectivity, you can see that you can see these things reflected here, but it's cloudy. Whereas if you compare it here, look how much shinier that is. So you still get all of the benefits of scratch resistance and hiding wear that you get from a stone wash, but it just has this beautiful luster to it. I absolutely love it. This is my favorite kind of finish that you can get on a knife. Now, an interesting thing is the jimping here was weird. For some reason, this jimping is just not very grippy. It's even less grippy. Like this has never been the most grippy, but it's even less grippy. And I noticed that it's certainly less grippy than over here. One thing that was really stood out to me is that the jimping for some reason is really kind of gnarly looking. I took a picture that I'll pop in, but I I don't know how they made it quite so jaggedy. I don't know if that's something that's just unique to this one or if they all tend to have that, but that was surprising to see. Moving back to this handle, we again have a kind of middle ground between those. We've got the straight line along the top, but we've got the same kind of finger choil and curve back here to a slight flare out the bottom that he has had on all of his other knives in this kind of category. The only exceptions are things like these where he's got these perfectly straight lines and symmetry. And this kind of handle feels so darn good. I love the way this sits in my hand. I love the way my finger wraps into this cutaway right here. And I love that the angle of this cutaway is leaning forward so that when I'm holding it in a very common grip like this, the backward leaning direction of my finger here lines up with the slope of this. I, he, these are the kinds of small details that he nails and handles. The ergonomics are fantastic. I talked about thickness. So on the waypoint and the drift, they both have these incredibly thin handles. These are 0.37 inches. Now, over here, this is now rounded out. And what you can see is we have contours. Over here, the drift, by contrast, is flat. And so the thing is, this is considerably thicker. You can tell right at a glance, this is much thicker looking, but it's actually not a thick handle. This is still only 0.46 inches, so it's less than a half an inch. And the reality is, is that, that that's the thickest point right at the center, and he slopes down. So if you put this up against the drift, you can see that at the edges, it's the same thickness. It's just flaring out in the middle. And what that gives you is a knife that is considerably larger feeling while still being thin enough to carry any discreetly in your pocket. And that extra girth really does make this fill your hand in a very, very pleasant way. Now, the weight of this knife is something I found a little bit disappointing. It's not a heavy knife at four ounces, but for a three and a quarter inch ish blade, that's more than the ounce and inch mark that I like to see. And more importantly, it feels heavy in comparison to his other knives. I'm so used to his other knives disappearing in my pocket that at four ounces, this one I finally start to feel. Now it's not heavy, it's just heavier than I kind of expected, but it's not for lack of trying. If we bounce some light up, you can see that on the reverse side, there are these big pockets milled out into the back, all these little holes and they carry up inside. And on the show side, you can see it's kind of hard to notice, but there's a pocket milled along this entire back part. And it looks at first like there's no pockets on this side, but that's because it's all been skeletonized on the front. All of this material has been milled out and replaced by carbon fiber, which is super lightweight. Now you can also get a micarta version, but that's still gonna be a lot lighter than if they had left this complete tie. Now what that leaves us with is a balance point that's right about there. I would have liked to have seen it just a hair more so it'd be centered in the front of this trail where your finger goes, but as is, this still feels like a very good balanced knife. I think you could pull off just a little bit of weight relief and also move that balance point just slightly forward by making this backspacer a little bit shorter, but I actually really like how clean and sleek this backspacer is, and it's very well integrated. It's just clean, minimal, has very flush lines. I like it a lot. Now he did an interesting thing here on the lock bar by having this curve up around and that allows him to keep the thickness here while still making this choil appear on the boat on the backside as well. You can see on something like the drift, we've got a much shallower choil here, that straight line. 
Here, in order to have this nice big cutout, he had to make this curve up too. It's kind of a cool look. He did another weird thing with this lock bar that I honestly don't know if I've seen anyone else do. He has both an external and an internal lock bar relief. It's kind of a weird thing and you still break up the line on the outside, but I can tell you why he's doing it. The reality is, is that if you try to do an internal lock bar relief on a knife that has sloped edges or, or contours like this, you're limited by how thin you can make it. A perfect example of that is over here on the IQ. You can see that this is also a contour handle knife and it has a radius on the outside. But by trying to take this internal lock bar relief far enough out, he's now starting to dip into that slope and you can actually see that there's a slight dip down in this dimension by coming so far in that dimension. So to avoid that and not have a dip down right here and keep this a flat line, he's made it only come out as far as this flat part and then taken the rest of that material off from the outside. And what we're left with is a block bar that's still nice and thin here and so we don't have an overly strong bar. And that's something that's a mistake that a lot of people make when they make contoured knives. They tend to not thin this out enough and you're left with a very stiff lock bar. So while I'm not sure if I love the aesthetic, it does have that functional purpose. The other thing is that making this so shallow means you completely eliminate any kind of snagging concern. So it's really just a visual thing that you still see it on the outside. Now this is the perfect time to start talking about this clip. And I think that this is one of the absolute best clips on the, in the market today. I mentioned that this design was introduced on the IQ and this is something that very few people are doing. The standard milled tie clip isn't deep carry because it's mounted either on screws that are internally mounted or externally, but either way they have to go through a landing post that limits how far that this can sit in your pocket. What he's doing here is way more complicated because this requires an additional axis of milling. This isn't a bent metal clip. This is a fourth axis milled clip that is milled first in this dimension and then turn sideways and milled in this way to take out that material and allow you to have a true deep carry clip. But you still get the benefits of having this be flat, not having any kind of jabby pointy thing in your hand and having it be way more comfortable than the standard bent metal clip. And the design here is perfect for that perspective. The comfort on this, you don't feel this clip at all. He's done a really cool thing. If you look at the way that the IQ's clip is done, that this is a flat surface along the back. And so this is easy to do this kind of flat back of the clip here and have it line up. Over here, this is a curved surface and you can see that they have maintained that curve perfectly as we go around. Now it's not that you can't see any kind of seam here, but this is a nice, smooth, continuous surface. And I love that little extra detail. And what you're left with is something that has basically no knife visible. Now there's an important difference though. If we look at this clip compared to the version on both the small and large IQ, and what that has to do with is the length and the thickness. If we look here at the small IQ, you can see how thick this material is and how long it is. And what we're left with is kind of a really nice springiness, but it still has a good amount of force. And so this stays put in your pocket. When we scaled this up to the large IQ, you can see that the actual thickness here gets even larger. And he made it longer to balance that, but also just visually balance it. But what he's left with is something that's, I think, too stiff. This is just a bit too much clip force. And I think that they should fix this by making this thinner here. But they've gone a little bit too far, in my opinion, over here. So the clip itself is even longer, but it's also been thinned out. And when you make something both longer and thinner, you dramatically increase its flexibility. And so what we have is a very springy clip. Now on the one hand, it's great because it goes into your pocket super easily, but it just doesn't have a ton of force right at the end. And so I found that this one, while it comes in and out easily, it can kind of push out of your pocket if there's an upward force from sitting down or something like that. So I think that the actual implementation wise is best done on the small IQ, but the style and everything, this is still such an incredibly fantastic clip design. And from an attachment perspective, this is again done by something where there's a screw right there, you go from the outside, but then also there is a screw on the inside that holds this in sitting right in there. Now there's one other aspect of the IQ's clip that I was disappointed to see didn't get carried over to the nine. And it's contributing to why it doesn't hold into your pocket quite as well. What I'm talking about here is this little flat landing pad that was milled into the handle. On both the IQ and the large IQ, we have contoured surfaces. And so what that means is this little flat landing pad that's milled right there allows the clip to make full contact the entire path of the way 
underneath with the handle. And as a result, it's making full contact with your pants and pinching it the entire path away. We have contoured handles again over on the nine, of course, but we don't have that kind of flat landing pad. So if I shine a little light up underneath, you can see that indeed, get it to focus, only making contact in that dead center spot right there. So when you combine the lighter lock bar pressure with the fact that it's only making that pressure contact right in the center of the clip, it just doesn't hold into your pants quite as well. So let's talk about the action, because that's where a lot of people are focusing when raving about this knife. And part of it is that it's just fantastic, but it's also very, very different from what you find in something like the Drift or the Waypoint. These both have great detents and great snap open, but they're both on Foster Bronze washers, which means that the close is that kind of smooth, slow, deliberate action. Over here, not only do we have bearings, we have a thicker blade stock, so a heavier blade, and a perfectly balanced lock bar strength. And so what we get is, oh, Excellent pop open, free fall guillotine home. Now he's able to get that snap open in part by having, like I said, really, really well tuned D10 strength, but also the placement of these thumb studs is slow down and far in enough. And the slope of this guides your thumb in exactly the direction to do that kind of upward flick that gives you that powerful, nice thwack. Now from the reverse side, you don't have the chamfer, but you still have enough gap here that you can get in really easily on these and flick it out. So both the reverse flick and the thumb flick are really easy to do and very, very satisfying. The thumb studs here are exactly the same as you find on the drift, and so they've got good traction along the top, but like I said, you get to push on the sides of them because of how good of access you have. Now, one thing I was surprised by, I said that the detent on this is tuned really, really well, but I was expecting it to be stronger than it is given the fact that it has fully deep engagement. And normally when you're sitting all the way down the detent ball, you're on a sharp enough slope on that detent ball that it's usually a pretty crispy detent. And this is a really well balanced medium. So I, I wanted to try and figure out why it's not stronger than it is, and so I suspected that the detent ball was probably pushed in slightly further than it normally is, and so I popped this under my microscope, and that's exactly what's going on. As you can see in this picture, the detent ball is just slightly lower down, and so as a result, Rather than having a relatively steep surface to push up, you're actually pushing up a surface that I measured at about 60 degrees. And so they have full deep engagement, but on a shallow slope. And so that's why they're getting that middle ground instead of a pretty firm detent. They're able to get this closing action by having, ooh, just perfectly balanced detent uh, lock bar strength. The, the thing that's normally causing a blade to slow down as it's going is by having pressure on the blade. And if you apply additional pressure yourself, you can see that kind of happening in action. But this, again, by having this be thinned out the way that they did, this is exactly the amount of lock bar strength that allows a blade of this weight to just go like that. I get it, the action on this is so incredibly pleasant. Now, one thing when it comes to closing, I often complain on a knife if it has a really late detent engagement. That's talking about how far do you have to close the blade before you hit that detent ball, because you have to go even a little bit further than that in order to be able to get up on the detent ball and have it do that free fall home. And on this knife, it's actually kind of bad. It's 27 degrees. But I can tell you on this particular kind of knife, the way that I close it, I don't care. And the reason is because this blade falls really easily to your thumb in a way that's safe. You can see that what's falling to your thumb is this back nub. And even if you pushed it further down, what would fall to your thumb is this big sharpening twill. And so in no way that I've ever closed this has this ever landed on me in a way that I would feel dangerous. And so the way that I typically close this is have this fall to my thumb and then have it close home. But if you're not the type of person that likes to have things fall to your thumb, then you might be annoyed by the fact that this has a pretty late engagement there. And the reason for that, why it is the where it is, is because this detent ball is just slightly further back than I would expect. So this is the kind of thing where if they move that just a hair forward, they would be able to make that be a quicker engagement and they'd get all the same benefits because you'd still be able to do that. And if all you're moving is in the vertical direction, you're not gonna be changing your radius here. So the lever arm distance of that detent ball and overall the resultant detent strength is all going to be the same. Now on the drift, I, I find that the point down here, this little tiny nub, is just a little bit sharp. So if this falls to my thumb, this can kind of pinch me in a way. But over here, this surface right here is nice and rounded off. And so I don't find that this pinches me at all if it falls, even if it catches just like the meat of my finger like that. 
Now from a construction perspective, we have basically the exact same thing going on here as the drift. The waypoint has an internal stop pin that's traveling through a smile-shaped arc in the handles, but on both the drift and the nine, what we have is a standard stop pin right here, which is making contact with a little nub at the back of the blade right there. And then in the open position, we have this groove right there. You can see as I open this up, it's this shape right there. So the stop pin, as you close is making contact with this entire curved surface. And that's going to increase the longevity because it's distributing that impact force across a larger source of material rather than all in one spot. And on both of these knives, you can see he does a nice thing where he carries this line up and continues it up just past the top. And so you don't have any kind of break in continuity as you go around. You can rub your finger around this knife and there's just nice smooth surfaces the entire way. Overall, the finishing work here is really well done. Everything is just perfectly rounded off in just the right ways. There's little tiny chamfers everywhere. There are no sharp surfaces anywhere. And this one has an interesting, perfect kind of middle ground balance between the more geometric sharp edges. These aren't sharp to the touch, but like visually sharp edges that you'll find in something like the Waypoint versus the more kind of rounded qualities you'll find in the IQ. Everything here has the, the softness of the IQ, but still the kind of feel of precision of the waypoint. And one of the places this precision is evidence is in this inlay work. There are a couple of places where I can kind of feel the transition at the very tip of my fingernail, but if you just run your finger over this, this is so perfectly smooth and seamless. And they did such a good job without having any gaps around any of these edges. This is fantastic inlay work. Another fun, interesting thing I wanted to point out, this is not important at all, but this is just a, a little small detail thing, is the inside finish of this path here is nice and clean. And what I think this is reflective of is the uh, process with which this this lock bar cutout was made. You can see that this is just a wide enough gap here that I can fit the tip of my toothpick in. And I believe that's because this is a machined path. And with machining, using a, like a mill to cut this out, there's only so small that you can make this gap. What you're left with is this really nice smooth finish. And under normal circumstances, when it's closed, you don't see it. When it's open, it's this entire path. Now, if you look over here onto the small IQ, you can see that this is, again, it's a smaller surface, but it's still wide enough that I can fit my toothpick in here. And you, again, have this kind of smooth gap. Now, but if you come over to the large IQ, you can see that this is finally now small enough that I can't really get the tip in. And a lot of people really like this clean look, but this is the kind of thing you get with wire EDM. And the problem with that is, I mean, if you consider it a problem, is that what you're left with in here is this kind of textural surface. Do you see that? It's just rougher and it doesn't look finished to me. And it's the kind of thing that most people would never even notice on a knife, but it's always a little bit bugged me. And I don't know how much I like it as a trade-off for having this nice clean line here. By the way, this is not at all unique here. So this here is the Riot made Brian Brown uh, Jaeger M and has the exact same kind of finish inside. And it's because it has this exact same kind of wire EDM thin line. And so on the one hand, some people might not like the larger gap here, but I love how clean this looks from absolutely every single angle. Now let's talk about my final thoughts on this knife. I think the aesthetic is fantastic. I think the ergonomics are so dang good and the cutting geometry is so good and the action is so dang good. I get why people love this knife. I personally still might not pick one up and it's just because I honestly don't like clip points all that much and I just have a ton of knives. But if he ever does release the drop point version of this, that might push me over the edge. Now the one elephant in the room that some people have talked about is the price. Why does this cost as much as it does? Because historically that $300 and above price point was exclusive to knives that he did in Vanex and the scarcity of that material and just the general higher cost of it in the first place kind of justified that price point to some people. This is quote unquote only in 20 CV. But the reality is I think that we're just seeing higher prices across the board at this point. And that's especially true of these OEM knives. Because when you have an OEM make a knife, you have to pay them enough money that they themselves are making a profit. And then you have to have a higher price on top of that for you to have your own profit margin. And so these, these kind of small batch boutique OEM knives are just always going to be on that more premium price point. And from a fit and finish perspective, this one does feel slightly next level compared to other things in the past. The finishing here is just so well done. Everything is both crisp and smooth. The action is just so dang dialed in and the finish on this blade is so gorgeous. I think if you like this look, like I said, 
Bryce is doing this better than just about anyone in the industry these days. And so I think it's the kind of thing where if you are able to spend that much money on this knife, you're not at all going to be disappointed. Okay, thank you for watching. I'll catch you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.